I, I definitely um, know what you mean when you say grace under fire, because when we have grace, we show a sense of belonging within ourselves. But I, I, I think what we do for a living, if nothing else, we try to inspire our coaches to recognize that if you're in the command of human beings, you got to get the heart right. I always look at people when they're in a conflict or something is happening in their lives is I'm seek to understanding them, right? If we have a difference of opinion, I'm seeking to understand why we have a difference of opinion instead of, oh no, you should agree with me. Hi Chuck, thanks you so much for being with me today. <laughs> Apolloni, it is my pleasure and thank you very much for having me on your show. Yes, I'm so happy to have you here. You've worked with so many people um, in your, you know, in your life and your in your in your speeches and everything that you've done for transformational leadership, coaching, communication. Um, and I I did introduce you, but I would love for the listeners to hear a little bit about you, what you've done, who you've worked with, and things because you've have so much history. And I'm just really, I'm really um I should say proud, but also I, I'm happy to have you on the podcast as well. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much. No, I really appreciate it. And to your listeners, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I hope I can provide some insights. Apollonia, like so many Americans, I am a product of immigrant parents. My parents are Brazilian. They came to the United States a year before I was born. But the reason I say that, like so many of us who grow up in two worlds, bicultural, bilingual, it's interesting that there is a randomness, so to speak, as toward we as Americans, what we grow up to do. And I grew up with a musician mom. My mom was a pianist. And my dad was a, was a college professor of linguistics. So my whole life, I was caught in the crossfire of music and words and language. Little did I know as I was growing up in, in living in two different worlds, that what I did or the influence that they had on me ultimately led me to what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. So the 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 musicality of language is really what I came to do for a living, but I had no idea that that was going to be my path. All I ever wanted to do was to go to Wall Street. There was something about it when I was in high school, and I couldn't tell you what it was. I didn't know what it meant. I had seen a picture of the New York Stock Exchange, and I said, this is what people do for a living? <laughs> I had no idea. But it, it, it spoke to me in a way like if I could spend all day running around yelling and screaming and making money at the same time, that's not a bad way to go. Yeah. So uh, the, the summary here is I grew up when I finally figured out that I was going to be a finance major. All I ever wanted to do was make my parents proud, become financially independent so I didn't have to count on them anymore, and then to go into a career in finance that was going to take me all over the world because of the worldview that I grew up with my parents. So I'm a Wall Streeter by trade, but I ultimately evolved into a whole nother thing throughout the course of that, but I am grateful for that background that brought me yeah. So you were in Wall Street for 25 years. Indeed. And the majority of my time was with a company called Bloomberg. And Mike Bloomberg was the mayor of New York for three terms. Many people may have noticed him on the debate stage as he was running for president. He came in late into the campaign. But Mike is a multi-billionaire. He is worth, I think, $65, $70 billion dollars. And he was a man who I was under the tutelage of for so many years, and I learned from him. He, too, was a Wall Streeter. He developed a financial technology company called Bloomberg, and I spent many, many years there using or selling the Bloomberg financial technology to Wall Street. So I was... I was in the world of Wall Street in the service of companies. For seven years, I was head of Latin American sales. So I traveled all over Latin America. I was responsible for building business anywhere south of the United States. Mm -hmm. So Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, they were my world for many, many years. 
And then I was for many, many years, I was their public spokesman. And this is where my transition occurred, but I had no idea at the time where it was going to lead me. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate that I spent a lot of time on the world stage. I did speaking engagements a couple hundred a year sometimes, and little did I know that I was progressing in my career, what I was really doing unbeknownst to me was building a bridge to what I ultimately decided to do when I. Right. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. I love that. And, and also too, the fact that you've been, you were, were working under, you know, a very wealthy, um, business and person. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, but I think the story, what, what people know about him is he is, you know, as we think about the multi-billionaires a hundred years ago, JP Morgan, all those, he is the modern Bill Gates, Jesus, Mike Bloomberg is in there, but there's much more to his story. He is an individual who came from very modest, humble beginnings that he taught me to wake up every day in the service of something bigger. bigger. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it wasn't just wake up every day and pursue the money. We never talked about that. Yeah. It was always do what you're trained to do. Don't worry about the, the outcome. If you just do what you're trained, the success will come. Mm -hmm. But the most important lesson he taught me he said, Garcia, if you're not making mistakes, you're not working hard enough. And that was a huge expression for this incredibly successful person, not to encourage us to make mistakes, but to recognize that the more that you do that, the more you become innovative, the more adaptable you become. He said, success is all in the adjustments. Mm -hmm. It's not just in the events. It's how you react to them. It's how you respond. And it's how you take the lessons that you have learned and you build on them mm -hmm. because you know you're going to make a mistake the next time. Build on that. Yeah. Take every lesson is cumulative. And so I am very grateful, Apollonia, for being under the tutelage of someone who gave us the freedom to make mistakes, to innovate but also to be held accountable for our results. Mm -hmm. So it's one has to go with the other. And, right. and that taught me to become adaptable, mm -hmm. to, to find different ways to communicate, to experiment with my own style and my own and how I speak and how I listen. And I, I think to anyone listening, the important part is not just what you decide to do for a living. It's the people that you decide to do it with. I, yes. cannot, I cannot emphasize that enough because the culture of the people in your gravity will ultimately shape who you become. And, mm -hmm. and so I feel my, my gratitude is to the people in my world who have helped shape my world view and have helped encourage me to continue to climb these proverbial mountains in spite of obstacles, in spite of barriers, and in spite of failures. And for mm -hmm. that, I'm, I'm, I'm really blessed. Yes, and I can tell that just, you know, I always think about this and what you said a little bit too is, you know, what there's a saying that says, you know, you are sometimes who you hang out with, you know, and-, and, and Oh, and indeed, you are a product of the five people that you hang out with. Exactly. You're the average of that. Yeah, and that's why- <laughs> When I said, I was like, wow, it's so amazing that you worked with him, you know? Yeah, he's rich. Yeah, he has a big, big company. Obviously, we all know that. But what I think when I, someone works with someone like that is like the stuff that you learn, it's at another level at that point, right? The stuff that you learn in the mix of that person as well. And it's really important that like, you know, when we talk about this, it's what you were saying, communication. How do we adapt to certain situations? How do we fail? And how do we come up from those lessons of failure? How do we articulate ourselves appropriately to the right people? And um, that's why, you know, I love that you're on here because I'm going to ask you a lot of those questions and you've wrote a whole book about it. And it's uh, this book right here, A Climb uh, to the Top, which is really, really good. It's about communication and leadership and tactics. And I definitely want to get into it because I get so many clients. I'm not checked. Maybe 70% of my clients um, talking about how do I communicate better? 
right? Just in life, relationships, everything. How do I get my point across? And how do I, you know, I'm just, and sometimes they're just, I'm just a bad communicator. Um, and so I wanted to kind of talk about that as well with you and maybe start with that. Um, when someone's talking about themselves and they're just not a good communicator and they believe they're not a good communicator. Yeah, and, and, and your, your point is so valid because I think all of us, no matter where we are in our careers, when we reflect on our education, think about your time in elementary school, high school, and college. Where did you spend the majority of your time and your energy? It was learning biology and, and, and math mm -hmm. and whatever else it was. However, what college and high school did not do, it did not teach communication skills. It did not teach collaboration. It didn't teach us how to, how to work effectively. Mm -hmm. It didn't teach us conflict resolution, which we spend an enormous amount of time doing. Mm -hmm. It didn't teach us how to stay calm under enormous expectations and pressures. Mm -hmm. And lastly, we never learned about the social science called emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. So when I look back and I think about the educational model, I'm not knocking it, I'm a product of it. But I think where I was maybe lucky, better to be lucky than smart, I knew that conventional education was solid, but it, there, there was a missing ingredient. And I didn't recognize how missing communication skills were until I noticed the people who did it particularly well. And that was early on in my career. There, there was something noticeable about certain people in the way they showed up, their presence, their body language. They spoke with purpose. Mm -hmm. They listened with intent I didn't notice whoever was the most brilliant, whoever went to Harvard, that's never appeared. What I noticed was, what is it about that individual, male, female, it didn't matter to me, there was something compelling that made me want to model their behaviors because I admired how well they communicated, but most important, the impact that they had when they showed up and how people were keyed in. Whatever they were saying, people were listening. Whatever body language they had, people started to imitate it. So I began to conclude, oh my God, this is what I want to do because I see the impact they have on me and other people. The question is, how do I do that? No one ever taught me. So that's a way of saying I came to the conclusion very strategically and intentionally, although I didn't know it at the time, oh my God, this is what I am admiring not the guy who is filled with facts and figures, not the one who, who, who just seems to exude brilliance. That didn't appeal to me. It was the human side of the people who exhibited grace under fire. They were calm under pressure. Mm -hmm. They communicated with impact. I said, my God, Apollonia, what have I missed in my education? But it was an opportunity. I said, there's my education. Mm -hmm. I got I got to do that. <laughs> then I had to hatch a plan to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like what, where does someone begin? So I know, you know, it's funny because I had a coaching call um, and we do a group coaching call and, you know, one of the, we do relationship love coaching is a lot and it's a heavy sometimes. And one mm. of the men were frustrated and I remember I just was very calm. You know, I, I think coaching also helps with communication skills as well, but Indeed. it's very calm. I knew how to handle it. I, and I, in those moments is the moments I love because those I know are my breakthrough moments for this person. Indeed. Right. Cause I, no I don't look at it as confrontation. I don't look at, I just look at it as a, someone is not being heard. Someone right. feels attacked. Someone feels under pressure. So this is the way I look at it. And I know from that standpoint, that helped me so much in just communicating in general with people all over my lives. And I noticed in a group coaching, I did it live. And after I did it, obviously he was great. He was so happy after we had a conversation about what he was frustrated about. And the guys that were viewing it said, wow, that impacted me so much how you stayed calm, but you were very direct. 
you placed boundaries, but you didn't, you know, you didn't get frustrated. You walked him through it. And now I see how boundaries look. Now I see how com effective communication looks. So when we don't see it, like, you know, we see it, but then how does someone start it? Right. How, how, how can we start that? Yeah, well, what, what, what you are articulating is as human beings, we, we want two things. We want to feel like we have been seen and we want to feel as if we have been heard, that we have a voice and we have a body. They, they have to go together. There's a visual and there's an audio. But my key word is feel. How do we make others feel that we have a voice and that we want to be significant? So what I, once I figured out early in on my career, I was like, well, nobody seems to be teaching any of this. How do they know that? And I, I sought advice from someone I looked up to, and he handed me a book that was written in 1936, and it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People, written by a guy named Dale Carnegie. And what he said to me, he said, Chuck, you're not going to find a formal education anywhere for what, what you are asking me for. How did I become who I became? It wasn't an accident, but it was in moments of self-reflection. If the world isn't going to teach me, then I got to figure out how I'm going to teach myself. Mm -hmm. So I read the book and it's got 30 chapters. And after I finished it, I said, my goodness, for all the psychology I had in college, for all the textbooks and the theories, this completely just, it didn't obliterate it all. It just had a completely different approach toward human behavior. And it had a lot of lessons in there about how to win friends and influence people. Like it was in my mind, like, oh my God, that's cool. That's what the people that I'm looking up to are doing. They are influencers, whether they intend to or not. So when I read the book, I said, oh my God, this is a, this is a life changer here. And then I read another book and I was actually, I was in Guatemala. We were mountain climbing in Guatemala and I had a book in my backpack and I took five days off from hiking to read this book because as I was reading and I said, oh my God, God, why didn't anybody tell me this? And the book was called How to Master the Art of Sales by a guy named Tom Hopkins. And as I'm reading it, I stopped dead in the tracks. I took out a pen and I just started to annotate. And I closed the book and I said, my goodness, I got it. This is what I'm looking for. Oh my God. And, and I started to practice it. I started to behave it. I started to do what the book told me. And I said, my goodness, these books are life changers. So throughout the course of my own career ascension, I was borrowing tactics from these books because they were speaking to me and they were so easy to execute. Behave like what these books are telling you. And they were contrary to everything I learned in college where I was told, get an A, be brilliant, memorize facts and figures. This was nothing like that. Mm -hmm. This was how to connect with others, how to speak with purpose, how to listen, particularly the listen with intent. Let people know you are dialed into them. Look into their eyes, give them the head nod, ask the right questions. I said, Jesus, nobody taught me this. So Apollonia, when I came to a point when my Wall Street career, I wanted to finish it, I formed my own coaching company for communication tactics and emotional intelligence. And my company is called Climb Leadership. And I'm a mountaineer, so I wanted to bring mm -hmm. that with me. And I said, somebody told me once, Apollonia, and when I asked somebody about what's the book that changed your life, the best advice I ever got, the book you write is the book mm -hmm. that will change your life. Wow. Right. And I said, oh, my God. And I had a reference of two other books that were like really cool. Like, oh, my God, I've read hundreds of books, but these two stuck out. And I thought about that, Apollonia, and I said, huh, the book you write is the one that will change your life? Huh. So as I started coaching and I started teaching people to step on stage or to speak in front of a camera, I, I was, had these PowerPoints and I didn't have anything cataloged. And I said, oh, my God, this is an opportunity. I'm going to start to write the book about my evolution and the, co the communication tactics I used every time I stepped on a stage, every time I walked into a meeting, every time I had dinner with my spouse, every time I spoke to my children. Mm -hmm. I said, this is how I learned self-developed 
communication tactics, I wrote the book. And then I started teaching college and I teach at Columbia University in the Graduate School of Engineering. And I teach communication skills and emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. So Apollonia, what I had here was a combination of all of these factors that I was able to distill and to centralize into my book called The Climb to the Top. And it also helps when you're an author, people respect that. So it's a calling card. Mm -hmm. But then people started reading it and I said, okay, this is working. What I learned to do, I'm now going to work every day helping others simply to learn what I did. You don't have to do it like me, but learn the power of emotional appeal. Appeal, yes. That was one chapter. Another chapter was called The Power of the pause. pause. Yep, that was, I wrote that down. Chapter eight, the power of the pause, because I talk about that so much. I feel the power in the pause as a person, as a human, is even as a woman, when it comes to just, you know, I talk about attraction a lot and love, you know that, yeah. but yeah. even that in general, but just even when you're on stage, I've noticed that giving speeches, when you pause, you captivate so much attention. Indeed. All you need to do is pause and it just shows confidence too. Mm -hmm. I feel like the power of a pause is so much bigger at times in those moments. And a lot of people get uncomfortable with that silence and that pause. Oh, they feel it's incredibly awkward when you're teaching somebody to not say anything. Mm -hmm just like I did now. And what I do, because there's a musicality to the way I teach, I call them beats. Okay, so you're gonna say something. You know, yesterday I was clever. Beat, beat, beat. And I wanted to change the world. Beat, beat, beat. Today I am wise. Two beats. So I am changing myself. Exclamation point. So in the way that we speak, we set up like a good comedian on a punchline. What yeah. you're really doing is you're putting the foundation out there. And then the pause is the opportunity for the listener to absorb, to reflect about one or two seconds. And then you come in with the next thing that you are sure that that first thing landed. And the reason chapter eight has become probably the most popular is because so many people just machine gun their way through. They pick the right words, but the words are lost in the speed and the cadence so that the impact is now minimized. Mm -hmm. What the power of the pause does, it allows the speaker time to think about what's my next statement and how I'm going to deliver it. And at the same time, the synchronicity between speaker and listener, the listener has now had that one or two beats to let this thing sit in, wait for it, give them time, and then bam, you come in with the punchline. If I had to write the book again, I probably would have made Power of the Pause the first chapter. <laughs> it's like, it's so mind blowing to people. It's like, oh, I can pause? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Same with you. And it's you know so what powerful. you do for a living too. You know, you, you, you are so communication focused. And also the way that you coach and your practice is very much about how we feel. You know, that's love and, and the, 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 the journey between our heart and our mind. There's only 18 inches that separates them. Yet the educational model, my humble opinion, it's too much in the mind yeah. and not enough teaching the heart. I agree. And co coaches like you, and I, I try to, to, to bring them both, we, we take a different approach mm -hmm. that we feel first as human beings. Let's, let, let's, let's, let's account for how we feel. Mm -hmm. Before what we think and think great thoughts, that's okay, but we got to get through the feeling of where we are in time and space, who we are hanging out with, and then we can get to great thoughts and mindful things, but I, I, I think what we do for a living, if nothing else, we try to inspire our coaches to recognize that if you're in the command of human beings, you got to get the heart right. Mm -hmm. so that people will feel attracted. They will feel right. like they want to be a part of you. And I'm not talking sexual attraction. I'm simply talking the ability to feel that you want to be in the gravity of other human beings. Mm -hmm. I don't want Your to be business. in the gravity mm -hmm. right, of somebody brilliant, just, just for brilliance sake. I want to be in the gravity of somebody who feels a little bit what I feel, mm -hmm. who empathizes with our situation, especially what you do, where people have challenges. You empathize with them through the heart. Mm -hmm. before you empathize with the mind. 
Exactly. And I feel like that gives you a deeper connection because the other person on the other hand also feels heard. I call that also a power of intuition. What we don't get taught is our intuition, you know, (laughs) Uh, we don't, I never heard of intuition until I was maybe in my twenties. They don't teach this, you know, and I think it's powerful stuff. And I also think that when we're older, it's our responsibility after we get up high school and go into college to invest in these things, you know, and I think coaching is such an, a whirlwind experience, finding coaches like you and just enjoying the process of learning these things um, is, is powerful because not only does it help you in your business, but it helps you in all avenues, I think in your life. And especially within yourself, when you really can understand and get the answers and then get the tools and actually become a part of the process of your tools. You know, it's, it's like a pat in the back. I did this myself. I learned this myself, you know, and then it gives you another side of confidence, I think too. Indeed. In fact, the unintended consequence of, of whoever is listening, the book that you are going to write is the one that will change your life. When I wrote A Climb to the Top, and I wrote it to be a leadership communication book that included the proprietary tactics that I developed. However, Apollonia, here's where the unintended consequence was, was a joyful moment. I wrote it as a framework for how we communicate, irrespective of where you are in time and space. But I wrote it as the business person writing it for the reader who had a desire or a goal to achieve greater success in their business. That's their climb to the top. So I was focused very much ensuring this is a book by a business person written for people in whatever business they are with the desire to ascend in their career. However, here is the best compliment I ever heard. I had a student that went on to Google. He had never been west of the Mississippi. He was born and raised in the New York area. And all of a sudden, through a series of circumstances, he's heading out to the Silicon Valley where he was completely intimidated and he got a job at Google. And his name is Anthony and he's just a wonderful individual. But what he said, he said, your book, this is the book that changed my life because I read the book originally, I think I'm going to be a business person. But what I found in your book, Chuck, all of a sudden, the tactics that I was internalizing and practicing, they were crossing every single thing I did. It wasn't just in a meeting room. It was in the restaurant. It was in being in the taxi cab. It was everything about the action and the interaction that we do with other people. And he said, once I let go of the fact that this is just not for business, this is a book about people with people. That's what How to Win Friends and Influence People did for me, and what a blessing it was to get that kind of feedback. It's like, oh, my God, even though I didn't intend it that way, I'm trying to help people in their careers. Look at what we do, Apolloni, when people come back and say, you helped me in my life. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, my God, like there's no higher calling than that. That wasn't my intent, but hey, let it be. Mm-hmm. And you too as well for your practice. You may be focused on something specific, but how often do you get those comments? Oh my God, other things got better. Does that happen to you? Oh, 1,000%, 1,000%. Yeah. Right. And, and I noticed too in chapter four of your book, uh, and it was, was, I think it's perfect to talk about this because also too, when I was reading the book, me, I was looking at it at a business point, but then as soon as I started reading more and more, I was like, no my mind just went straight to like, this can help so many men and just their relationships with people, others, women, women with men, it doesn't matter. It's in regards to relationship. And this is something I talk about too, um, when it comes to this is in chapter four, it's the, the body speaks before the mouth opens. Indeed. And I like how you broke down in a percentage, um, 55% is body movement, 38% is voice and tonality, and 7% is your words. Yeah. When I wrote that chapter, I was actually conscious of something that others that I have to really hammer home. And that's the first impression. Generally, and there was a book I read called Executive Presence that put that into perspective where the first impression occurs in the first 250 milliseconds. You are seen before you are heard. So think about even if I put somebody in, 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 in the, let's model an interview. You're in a waiting room. And, and you're sitting there and you're waiting for someone, Joe comes out, whoever that may be, Joanne comes out, hey, it's nice to meet you. They have a view into you 
before they actually hear your voice. Mm -hmm. So immediately what the human beings do, we tend to process what we see because we believe everything we see. We don't believe everything we hear. Words lie, but our vision doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I wrote that very conscious of the fact that if 250 milliseconds, which is faster than the blink of an eye, Somebody, when they're forming an impression about you, Apollonia, or anyone else, they immediately think, are you likable? Are you respectable? Are you trustworthy? Are you competent? How could it be that somebody begins to form those impressions about you before you've even said a word? Mm -hmm. Well, that's the human condition, and that's we have to be able to speak to that. So what I found in, I wrote the body language chapter is everybody be mindful of mm -hmm. how you show up, of what you say before you say it. And also body language there, I, I, I catalog five different categories of body language. Four of them can get you into trouble. Yes. And, and, that. and there's one of them that is Good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, so, so what we, particularly in the Zoom world, it's not a lot different. What I teach in body language is there's three key factors in how we show up. First of all, our hands, our eyes, and our mouth, just mm -hmm. those three. Think about the impressions that we form at the interview. When you're standing tall, you're smiling, your eyes are wide open, and you take your hand out to shake it. Three things are going on, and immediately before you say, hey, Apollonia, it's nice to meet you, somebody is completely dialed in. Are you looking me in the eye? Is your handshake firm? Are you standing tall and confident? The reason I say that, the opposite side of that, you stand up, you're slumped over, you don't make eye contact, you have a lousy handshake, you've got a very big mountain to climb because immediately you have formed a mal impression in the mind of the interviewer where, oh my, you better be really good because right now in that first 250 milliseconds, you have showed me disengagement. By lack of a smile, you have demonstrated you really don't want to be here because you're sure is not happy to meet me and not making eye contact Think about in the love that you teach, how important it is. So important. And it's not just a love lesson. It's a, it's, it, it, it's a business person. It's trust. Seeing is believing. And this is what we use to see. Then why don't we do it better? And that's the reason it was so important that the body speaks before the mouth opens. I loved writing that chapter because it was revelatory to many people that just took it for granted. Yes, I agree. And even, I think one thing I want to mention is when someone shakes my hand, and it's very weak. It makes me feel like, oh, it just, it doesn't give, it makes me feel, but then also too, when someone shakes it really hard, it makes me feel like, oh, that was a lot, you know, but I'm happy they're here. But also too, I understand <laughs> that. And I want to point out too, on that chapter, because we're on that topic in chapter four, the five things that you talked about, just for some of the listeners, I don't want to go over all of it because I know that they should be getting the book as well. Because I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is one is you were talking about like aggressive and you give examples of what that is, you know, when you do that um, defensive and also nervous. And I think nervous comes in that when I, when I look at someone and they shake my hand and it's very light, I'm like, oh my gosh, she must be so nervous or she must be so nervous. And I think that as well. And then you have, and then the biggest one out of all of them that I love is that you explain what it is for someone to show interest. And that was the open one because everything else is closed. There was five of them, but the one is to show interest. And we go into in the book of like how you would share, show interest in the first impressions. And I like how you just broke it down on all of the five bullet points on how to do so as well. And that's, that was really, really important. I think it's basics, but it's also... Sometimes we need those basic things as a reminder because we get so caught up in how am I going to make this other person feel that we forget about how we're presenting ourselves. Indeed. And, you know, and I think also back to my college education as a business major, nobody taught me to shake a hand. Nobody told me to look someone in the eye. They just took for granted that we know how to do it. It's nobody's fault. But, but think about what we're discussing now, Apollonia. We're training people to do something that no one else taught them. They're so critical, yet we take it for granted, not because anybody chooses to, be, because nobody's raising the level of consciousness of how important these moments are. 
Mm-hmm. Particularly in an interview, think about how important you want to go to Goldman Sachs or Google, wherever you go, you got to nail that interview. And where do you begin? You begin in the first second. What do you say before you say it? And so much feedback I get from employers or even from my students immediately seem disengaged, weak handshake, no eye contact. That's what they're leading with in the feedback. And if that's where you're leading, that does not portend well for the conclusion. The contrary to that, very engaging, look them in the eye, strong handshake, smile. Immediately, you're making the interviewer feel how you want, how you showed up. Mm -hmm. So immediately, they are predisposed to this positive vibe that you are emitting. Now, all you got to do is not screw up because they're, they're feeling good about it. And if you just carry the momentum of your body language, feeling confident, and then however the interviewer feels, it's bouncing off. Yeah. It's just this vibe going back and forth. And now your confidence is building mm-hmm. because the interviewer is now smiling. And mm-hmm. think about the human dynamic, just as love and what Alex talks about in seduction. It, it's this constant interaction of energy. energy. Bad energy begets bad energy. Mm-hmm. Good energy begets good energy. And then you build on the platform of good. Mm-hmm. If you start with bad energy, it's very difficult to try to rebuild that into something positive. Yes. So I appreciate you pointing out the body language. It is a critical component and often misunderstood. Mm-hmm. So what people key into, to any advice to our listeners, it's your words, your bearing, how you show up. And then the third part, the manner by which you engage. Yes. Think about that. How do you show up and what is the manner by which you engage? Mm. Your words don't have to be perfect. You can occasionally stumble. It's okay. It's not the worst thing. But when you bring energy and enthusiasm to the interaction, all of a sudden, the interaction continues to build momentum into what you hope is the conclusion. And body language is where it all begins. Yes. And I like that you said manner by when, by in which you engage, right? Manner by which you engage. So that I, when you say that, and I want to go into the next topic of what you talk about as well and what you teach. um, When you say that, I think... Hmm. Social cues, mm-hmm. emotional intelligence. Right. And I've worked with plenty of men that had very low, I would say metrics of social, emotional intelligence, Indeed. and they are just frustrated yeah. and because they know it, you know, people tell them this. And so um, that right there reminded me of that is picking up on those social cues because that's a big part of emotional intelligence. Can we touch a little bit on what emotional intelligence is and how someone can get help obviously with you, but your book and everything, but how someone can walk away with a piece of advice on that, because I know it does get very frustrating because I've noticed when people don't have that EQ, they long for connection. People long for connection, but it's very hard to get that connection too. Indeed. And, and, and what you're describing is so apt yet misunderstood. And it's also, it's a modern social science. So it hasn't really made its way through, through the, the, the conventions of education yet, but it's getting there. Before I describe what it is, I want to put something into perspective that I think for our listeners is a very important point. As an executive coach myself, I've had the luxury of working on two what's called succession plans, where the company comes to me to help me to help determine what are the skill sets that we want from our next CEO. And this is two very large companies where I work with the C-suite, and here is interesting Apollonia, the conclusions. When I spoke to the board and to many people in the company, I said, what, what are your expectations as it relates to the characteristics of your next leader? And while there's a million things that were thrown out, interesting how in both of these projects, the conclusions were down to three key characteristics. Number one shows grace under fire. So forget the pedigree, forget your GPA, forget your background. Are you calm under pressure? Mm-hmm. Number two, the ability to resolve 
conflicts effectively. Now, now, mm -hmm. now, now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm giving, giving runway to the third point. And the third point, we want a leader in 2021 who shows an empathetic leadership style. Mm -hmm. And what they're saying is the era of leadership of command and control no longer relevant, not in this day and age. We are in the age of leadership where people have an expectation that their leader is empathetic, that they show high levels of emotional intelligence. So I state that as a matter of perspective. Now let's determine what it is. Emotional intelligence is the ability for any individual to be able to manage and to control the emotions in a world that is fraught with anger and derision. Mm. When you turn on the radio, when you turn on your TV, especially in the ele election, I'm not making any political statements. But what I am saying is we are a country and a world that is divided. In the UK, Brexit, not Brexit. In the United States, Republicans and Democrats. But this is no longer political. This is now personal. Mm -hmm. And the amount of anger that shows up on social media and people arguing and defriending themselves because they believe something different is nuts. But what happens, it triggers often when we get into these emotional places that are uncomfortable to us, it triggers an emotional response. Mm -hmm. And this is something we call the fight or flight response. Yeah. And in an emotional intelligence, and this is what's so lovely about this, it's, it's the ability to understand where you are in the interaction mm -hmm. and being trained and conditioned as to how to manage the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. So the emotional triggers that often happen in human beings causes something that's called two things, adrenal over, overdrive, where our adrenaline grant, our adrenal grant glands just go crazy and we blow up at people. The other term for that is emotionally, emotional hijacking. So mm -hmm. immediately our emotions are held captive by something that we don't know how to control. It's okay to be angry. It's not okay to be a jerk. So the space between the anger that is fomenting and your ability to control it and to show grace under fire is what we call emotional intelligence. Yes. It can be measured, it can be monitored, and it can be developed. This is what I teach at Columbia University to the engineers. I teach presentation skills right out of a climb to the top, and I teach emotional intelligence, but here's the best part. I teach the integration of the two. Mm -hmm. If someone is gonna step on stage, they're going, there's gonna be an EQ moment in there. So we wanna teach them the tactics of how to speak with power and purpose, but also we wanna help them control the nerves, not just anger in an interaction, just your own sense of staying <laughs> calm. <laughs> so they're not freaked out in front of 500 people. So forget the anger, just controlling, stay calm, stay grounded. The magic Apollonia is keeping the high performance expectation of energy and enthusiasm, yet this weird equilibrium of staying controlled and in your lane without getting so nervous that you blow the very thing that you're trying to convey. Mm. And so EQ is here to stay. Many companies, including many that I work for, we measure it. There are lots of books. There's one called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Yeah. You read it, take a test or you know, an assessment. It tells you self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, relationship management. It's a quad. I love that oh, book. Great things. And me too. But I wish someone had taught me that. Why didn't anybody teach us this stuff? Yeah. This is so valuable because it's about our human behavior. This is where we get promoted. We don't get promoted on technical skills. Everybody's brilliant. Mm -hmm. We get promoted, grace under fire, conflict resolution, empathetic leadership style. Mm -hmm. Like these are bells ringing. Like who knew? Yes, exactly. We're telling you and I, we're telling the world, this is the modern world and the expectation of our leaders. Oh my God. I thought it was to the guy who has a bullwhip. <laughs> Not anymore. It's a different world. We, yes. Our expectations have changed. So let's train people as to what the marketplace is telling us. Mm -hmm.
I like that you said grace under fire too, because as soon as you say, and you explain that so well, probably the best I've ever heard. Um, and I refer a lot of my clients to, to read emotional um, intelligence 2.0. I think it's by something Mayberry. I forget the name, um, but uh, the author, but um, I, I definitely um, know what you mean when you say grace under fire, because when we have grace, we show a sense of belonging within ourselves, but also one thing I will say for myself personally, and maybe I did it right or wrong, but how I got better with EQ and showing up in that way was I always look at people when they're in a conflict or something is happening in their lives as I'm seek to understanding them, right? If we have a difference of opinion, I'm seeking to understand why we have a difference of opinion mm-hmm. instead of, oh no, you should agree with me right? So it, I think that helps us show up in grace because then we, we, we show up in grace. We're comfortable with ourselves because we have a sense of belonging that not only helps us, but it helps us pick up on those social cues. When someone's uncomfortable in a conversation, okay, I see how their body language is reacting. Let me move on to other things as well. Um, and I really feel like that question for me to seek to understand helped me so much in becoming very empathic as well, you know, with people yeah. and as a business owner and as a coach, um, and it helped me connect. Well, I want to give credit to another book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And, and he describes in the book seven different things that he thinks everybody should do that is a pattern of people who are effective. And the one that had the biggest impact on me, it's interesting you say that, while there are many things in there, it said, and, and I want to say this very slowly, and I want to, I'm going to pause for dramatic effect. And this has been hammered in my head when I read the book. I just couldn't stop thinking about it. And here it goes. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Mm -hmm. And the reason it sounds so simple, but what I witness in my coaching is people talking over each other. Republicans are screaming at the Democrats. What, what, what I often don't see is people taking the time to first, okay, what is the point of view of the other individual? And very calmly acknowledging the difference of opinion, it's okay to have a difference of opinion. But if we first try to at least even attempt to understand Help me to know where you're coming from. First, I think the most honest thing that we can do is to be clear about our disagreement, not to subterfuge or to pretend, oh, yeah, I kind of think so. Very clear. I hear what you're saying. I don't agree with your point of view. I would like to discover what you mean. Think about the impact just by trying to discover in another person and giving them the space to help you to understand That goes a long way in showing I care about your opinion. I'm not dismissing it. I just don't agree with it. Mm -hmm. So let's seek first as best we can to understand the point of view before we dismiss it or before we, we jump all over it and tell you how wrong you are. Yes. Opinions aren't wrong, but I think we are not doing a great job in this incredibly divisive world of seeking first. Even if we do understand, that doesn't mean you may not change my opinion, but what the empathy brings is the desire to create the dialogue to help me to understand. And only then can I be understood. Otherwise, we're just, we're just, talking and we're not communicating yes and that's a big part of conflict resolution in itself huge part significant part (laughs) in fact i would imagine for your practice apollonia you know there there is love and people give love and people get love but even the most loving relationships whether we like it or not conflict is going to show up oh for sure The loving couples know how to condition and how to respond to the conflict rather than to beat each other up for it. Exact. Respond. You said it right there. They know how to respond. They don't react. I have a huge program that I talk about how communication, responding versus reacting in uh, in relationships. 
Um, and I love that you said respond because it's so true. We need to learn how to respond instead of react, right? And that's that's why I say that's a huge part of conflict resolution. Yeah. Um, Chuck, I know you've been here with me for a while. This was so amazing. I loved having you on. You've gotten so many great advice about, wow, I was just, I was kind of like in the moment where I was like, oh, forgot I'm interviewing here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Apolloni. It's such a pleasure. And I think I, I, I am grateful to you for, for the world, the, the work and the love you bring in the service of other people's happiness. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about what I do. I try to go to work in the service of someone else's success. And that's the way I think about it. And if other things come of it, beautiful, that's great. What you do though, this is the first thing to us as human beings, how do we live lives of happiness? And then how do we live lives of prosperity? What a wonderful combination for you and I, and I'm grateful that, that there are people like you who are helping people to understand and to learn how to love, because it, it doesn't happen by accident. We're not very good at it. So thank you for bringing that work. But most important, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to your show. I'm grateful that you had me on. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. And I know a lot of the, the listeners are going to purchase the book. Everyone that's listening, the links will be below in the description box as well. Um, you can find it on Amazon as well, correct? And mm -hmm. um, Amazon, on yeah. your website? Yeah, my website is chuckgarcia.com. There is a tab on there that says a, it says a climb to the top and there's a book. And then, and then I have a radio show and it's called A Climb to the Top. So we're very consistent. But I'm really grateful to, to anyone who reads A Climb to the Top. There is also a tab called Assessment. And what you can do is you can take the assessment. It's a whole bunch of questions. And you, when you answer the questions, it shoots it to me. And I see it, just me. No one on my staff, nobody. I then will recommend, hey, if you're reading A Climb to the Top, you'll likely want to focus on chapter eight, power of the pause, chapter three, speak with conviction. That way somebody can, this is the education. It's not just reading the book. The education is practicing and putting it out there. And mm -hmm. one of the ways to do it is with the self-assessment where I can help guide you to pinpoint the areas that I think are most important. So thank you for it. If you're looking for more incredible content that will change your life in dating and relationships, check out this video right over here. This is absolutely made for you. And also too, don't forget to download this free ebook down below. It's my seven common mistake ebook that men make when attracting women in dating and relationships. And I have it specially for you. See you in the next video.